Hey everyone, I'm Andy Raphael from eTechnics.com and today is a bit of a weird one, purely because, well, I've made videos in the past telling you how to build a gaming PC, how to build a streaming PC, how to build a variety of different PCs. Now, I'm not normally one to call out people, but on this occasion, I just had to. So on, the, on September the 13th of this year, The Verge published a video on YouTube, how we built a $2,000 custom gaming PC. The problem was, um, if you watch the video, it's kind of, at first, I admit, I thought it was satire. And then I slowly kind of discovered that it wasn't. And uh, well, you'll see why. I'm actually gonna go through this video and I'm gonna kind of analyze essentially what they've done. And it really should be titled, how not to build a $2,000 custom gaming PC. So let's sort of jump in and well, take a look. So a few years ago, TC or managing editor built a gaming desktop, but it's kind of out of date and it's definitely not gonna hold up for Battlefield 5. So let's build a new one. You can build a gaming desktop for around $1,000, but I wanna go all out, so I spent around 2,000. You can build a gaming desktop for $1,000. You can do it for way less than that. We've actually got videos and I'll probably link to it somewhere. Uh, you can actually build Essentially, if you want to play at 1080p, we did a, a gaming desktop that I think was like 400 pounds or $500, something like that. So a lot less than $1,000. All out is not $2,000. I mean, we're doing an Obsidian build, which again, I'll link to somewhere, uh, which is probably going to be more than 10,000, probably close to about 12,000 US dollars. So all out is not $2,000. So that's my first point. PC like this is gonna be able to play most games at ultra settings. So, what do you need to build a desktop? Well, of course, first you need a table. Did he seriously just say you need a table? Right, you do not need a table. The amount of PCs that I've built on the floor, and I know even some people get weary then having a graphics card just sitting on the floor, but you don't need a table. So it's a bit of a redundant point saying that that's the first thing you need. Preferably not metal. If it's gonna be metal, have an anti-static working surface layered on top of it, a thermal paste applicator, an Allen wrench, some tweezers to tie up the wires, a Swiss Army knife, which hopefully has a Phillips head screwdriver in it. Okay, I'm gonna to have to stop it there. So I've never used an anti-static surface or anything. I'm actually using a mouse mat at the moment. You may have seen in some of my videos, I had like a, an alpha cool one, which essentially is an anti-static mat, but I use it more for Firstly, not scratching my table. Secondly, just it's something soft to kind of put stuff on and you can see it's a bit more organized, blah, blah, blah. But that's kind of, you know, where that goes. Now, I've never ever used an Allen wrench or an Allen key. The only time that you'd ever need that is if you're doing something with custom loop water cooling. So you're gonna be using um, probably something from like Alpha Core, which has um, sort of, you know, hex screws on it and things like that. Thermal applicator, okay, some people use them, some people don't, there's really not that much variance. I personally think it's not needed for like your first gaming PC. Um, so yeah, there's that. Then tweezers, well, these are tweezers. He did not show tweezers in the video. Tweezers are little things like this. You know, these ones I think are specifically made for your eyebrows, but he actually showed zip ties. I don't know why he called them tweezers, they're not tweezers, they're zip ties. They cable tie stuff together. So yeah, and then a Swiss army knife that hopefully, he says, hopefully has a Phillips attachment. I mean, I've never built a PC using hopes and dreams. Apparently he does. So, and why you'd use a Swiss army knife anyway? I mean, if it was me, I'd be actually using a fully fledged screwdriver set, which doesn't hopefully have a Phillips attachment. It actually has a Phillips attachment. Look, screwdriver, this one's made by Fantex. I think you can actually buy this. I got given it at a show, but here's a screwdriver. And here's my Phillips attachments. There's no hopefully about it. It actually has Phillips attachments. Why would you even use a Swiss army knife? I don't know. It can't get any worse, can it? And last but not least, an anti-static bracelet, which is to protect you and the parts. Okay, an anti-static wristband or bracelet as he calls it. Um, it's an anti-static wristband. Normally you attach it and then it attaches onto something so that it grounds yourself. His one apparently is a new standard, it's actually wireless. I've never seen a wireless anti-static wristband before, but it does look similar between either a Livestrong bracelet or an elastic band. So let me put that on there. Okay, I've got my elastic band, uh, my anti-static band, I'm good to go, I'm safe. I'm not grounded from anything, but apparently I'm safe. 
So yeah, let's see how that goes. Our PC's power supply is of course channeling electricity, in that it adjusts and provides the right amount of energy to keep it running. Last but not least, RAM, or random access memory, and your hard drive... Okay, RAM. So their diagrams and everything, I admit, look freaking cool. Uh, what they've done with it, it looks amazing, but they're showing three sticks of RAM. Now, it looks good, but three sticks of memory means, I mean, at least in my eyes, triple channel memory. I think the last time I used triple channel memory was for the X58 platform. So even since then, we've had X79, X99, X299. Just a bit old school. Maybe it's just a bit of an oversight, but still, yeah. We have a lot of boxes and a lot of PC parts, so it's best if you unbox them, isolate the parts that you really need, place... Okay, he's just, I don't know why, you might have to actually slow down the video to see it, but he's completely obliterated some of the boxes. I mean, when I open boxes, I, I like, I mean, I like to keep them. They're just something handy to, to have if you want to reuse parts, that kind of thing. He literally just ripped open the power supply box. So I'm actually going to show you how to open a power supply box the correct way, okay? Let me grab a power supply. So I'm gonna go with Corsair, because he went with a Corsair. This is the AX1600i, and I'm gonna show you the professional, proper way to open it. Are you ready? I'll do it slowly. Doing it slow. That wasn't so hard, was it? Some notes about installing motherboards, they're really delicate, you should be really careful with them. And screw in with confidence, but also don't screw in too hard. Screw in with confidence. <laughs> As opposed to what? Fuck. I'm confidence. Give me my screwdriver. <sighs> Otherwise you could crack the board. I chose Asus's Z370 motherboard for two main reasons. One, it has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and also it has support for NVMe SSDs, meaning you can get really... Okay, I want to stop it there because why is he installing the motherboard straight into the chassis? Like generally, and you've probably seen it from my videos, I'd install as much as I physically could onto the motherboard first. So you're talking the processor, thermal paste, it's cooler if it will allow it. Obviously, if you're using an AIO, it's a different story or custom loop. But if it's an air cooler, you can bolt that on there. M.2 um, drive, so that could be SATA raw, NVMe, um, and memory as well. So basically try and build as much as you can onto the motherboard. So when you do transfer it to the case, it's just generally easier. Obviously, if you are using an AIO, like I said, that's a different story. Probably wouldn't put the thermal paste on then because you're likely to just put your hand all over it and make a mess. Really fast SSDs that are... And, and also, why did he line the motherboard up before putting the IO shield in? I mean, the IO shield comes with the motherboard. So it's specifically for that motherboard. You don't need to line it up to make sure it goes on. It's, it's from the same motherboard box. <sighs> These that are really easy to install, pay close attention to the brace that goes at the... Did he seriously just call an IO shield plate a brace? I mean, I, I've watched a couple of people react to this video, including Bitwit Kyle, uh, or Lyle, and um, even he said braces are like for your teeth or like holding your clothes up and stuff. It's not a brace, it's an IO shield plate. Seriously. It was at the back of the computer. You always have to make sure that you really hammer it in because there's no screw. Do not hammer it in. <laughs> Please do not hammer it. Why did he say hammer it in? I mean, he didn't physically use a hammer, but he said that it, you have to hammer it in. I mean, it, it has notches on an IO shield plate. You just kind of push it in evenly. You don't need to use any brute force. Do not use brute force. It's an IO shield plate, not a brace. Just put it in, it, it'll be fine. <sighs> I chose Corsair's 16 gigabyte Vengeance LED RAM for two- Good RAM. Two main reasons. One, it has LEDs and we do like lights in our gaming desktops. Secondly, uh, it's pretty fast RAM. It's 2,666 megahertz, I believe. So it's- Right, Two, 2,666 megahertz is not fast RAM. So we're talking DDR4. When we're talking DDR4, I would consider fast RAM as, I guess, 3,200 megahertz or above, probably even higher than that. So 4,000 megahertz. 2,666 is pretty much your, well, typical for like DDR4. So yeah, I wouldn't consider that fast. So it's pretty fast and this motherboard supports that speed, which is most important. Open the slots first and just aligning the stick with the middle of the strip, not with the end, and just lining that up with the logo. Lining up with the logo? No. On a motherboard, it has notches. Memory has notches. It 
kind of only goes one way. I don't know what logo he's talking about. But yeah, that's not the right way to do it. Line up the notches. Do not push down if the notches don't line up. It's really that simple. So once you hear that solid clasp and you don't see the gold connectors on the side anymore, that's when you know the rem is in. Step three, we're going to install. Okay, he clearly doesn't care about dual channel mode either. So when it comes to a motherboard and you're best off looking in your, your motherboard manual or instructions, it will show you if you're running in dual channel, quad channel, uh, you know, depending on your motherboard. If you're using an old motherboard, maybe triple channel, single channel, he's basically put them in the wrong slots. I mean, why would you put them in the wrong slots? He clearly doesn't care about getting the most speed out of this super fast 2666 megahertz memory. <sighs> right to install the hard drive, or in this case, the NVMe SSD. I chose this format of solid state drive so that I could input it into the motherboard without having to worry about extra wires or putting it in a separate part of the case and just getting really messy. This is from Kingston and it's- Okay, so he's using a Kingston SSD, uh, M.2, I believe. If it's NVMe, it's probably like a KC1000 maybe. I understand, yes, cable management is obviously easier because you haven't got a 2.5 inch drive with a SATA cable in it, but there's more, well, there's better reasons to choose an NVMe drive than just, I didn't want cables. NVMe is a lot faster than a conventional SATA SSD. So even if you went for a normal SATA SSD, you're gonna be talking like 550 megabytes a second read speed, 500-ish uh, megabytes a second write speed. NVMe, I mean, you could go stupidly crazy and get ones that are up to sort of 3000 megabytes a second. So saying, I chose this because I didn't want all these cables everywhere. Yes, that's kind of a secondary reason, but the first reason is, well, you've just gone and spent more money on a drive, what, just for cable management? No, it's for the speed. It's all about the speed. It's 480 gigabytes, so it's not a lot, but you can always upgrade this and swap it out, and it's only held down by one screw and the latch, so it's really simple. Okay, so he mentions it's only held down by a screw and a latch, but then looking at it, he hasn't actually put the stand off. And it looks like he's screwing the NVMe drive directly onto the motherboard. So generally you'd get these with your motherboard, which is a tiny little standoff and a little screw that just kind of brings up the M.2 drive so that it's in line. He's screwing it down onto the motherboard like, oh. Is this computer even gonna work? So it's really simple and really straightforward. Speed for gaming is important when it comes to a hard drive. You want files to write quickly and you want games to- Okay, yeah, it's confirmed. He's screwing it directly down onto the motherboard. So yeah, that's not gonna do the M.2 socket, well, any good whatsoever. And you're gonna line this bracket with the back end bracket of your PC case. Lots of brackets. You're aligning the bracket of the GPU with the bracket of the chassis. Brackets, brackets, braces, brackets. Case. Now, which lane you choose depends entirely on what other parts you're gonna put in the system. I'm just... Okay, kind of. I'm just gonna pick the top one because the SSD is at the bottom and I don't wanna cover it. I just think it looks nice. Okay, he decided to put the GPU in the top slot or lane as he called it. Admittedly, it's a PCI Express lane, I'll give him that. But he chose it because of his M.2 NVMe drive with no cables is below it. So that's why he chose the top slot. No, right. On a motherboard, depending on your motherboard, of course, if you're going smaller form factor, then it's gonna be a bit different. But on an ATX motherboard, you're gonna have X16 slots, X8 slots. There is a difference between them. It's not just, I'll choose whichever one looks the prettiest. No, you go for the primary slot, which generally is the top one. So at least he lucked out on that one. Click down. Take your remaining brackets and just put them in the spots that you haven't used. Remaining bracket, why, why is he taking these brackets out in the first place? So he's talking about the PCI uh, expansion slot covers, which are normally ventilated. He's taking them out so then he can decide where he's gonna put his GPU. Luck will have it, it did go into the right slot. But I mean, the only reason you would take these out is to clear space to make your arbitrary choice of PCI lane and <laughs> Next. You don't have to screw these in. They get bolted down by the back end bracket. And your GPU is installed. Power supply time. I chose Corsair's 850 watt power supply because I need enough headroom for ray tracing GPUs when they come out and I don't want to have to upgrade it again. So all you have to do is take the brick. 
did he seriously just say, take the brick? He referred to a power supply as a brick. Okay, story time. This is a power supply. It's a Corsair AX1600i. I'm actually going to take the power supply itself out. It looks very similar to the one he has, just a little bit more powerful, slightly different branding, but I'll show you the difference. This is not a brick. This is a power supply. This is not a power supply. This is a brick. Power supply, brick. Brick, power supply. Ugh. Moving on. And make sure that you align it with these little insulating pads. So the They're not insulating pads, they're anti-vibration pads. What are you insulating against? Seriously? So the power supply doesn't short circuit and come into contact with the rest of the system. Nope, I'm done. See ya. I'm going, I've had enough. Okay, I've calmed down for now. So just take it in, slide it in nice and easy until you have a snug fit and then shift it to the back and make sure it's right up against the frame. Now you just take the required screws and you Okay, right, typically when you put a power supply inside a chassis, you'd want to, especially with a modular power supply, you'd want to put the cables into the power supply first so you know you can look at your system and say, okay, I need my 24 pin, I need my eight pin or an eight plus four, I need my eight and the six pin for the graphics card, I need my SATA cables, plug it all in and then that way you're good to go. No one wants to kind of do that after the power supply is in there. And why the hell is he actually using a knife instead of a proper Phillips screwdriver? <sighs> Tighten and screw in. So next step, we're going to install the CPU core. In this case, it's gonna go on the top end of the case and we're just gonna have the hose hang out for a little while. Hose. Hose. Let's do a dance. I've got hose. I've got hose. Always be sure to try to place it in the system first before you install it, because you can see it takes up a lot of space. But in this case, no pun intended, it fits in perfectly, and we're gonna start screwing it in. And Okay, so I actually, that's pretty good advice. He said, line things up, check space, etc. first. I mean, I completely agree with that. I'm building a custom loop system at the moment, which is just on the floor next to me. And yeah, I kind of have to do all the planning of where I'm gonna put the tubes and you know, uh, all the tubing and stuff. So yeah, I completely agree with that. One thing I don't agree with is that he's installing the AIO and there is currently no fans on it. So is he gonna take it back out to put the fans on or is he gonna try and sort of somehow get in there and do it that way. There's nothing special about this screwing in process. They're just really long screws because they go through the entire frame of the cooler and they take forever. Okay, so he's using the long screws that come with an AIO, which typically go through the fan and then into the radiator. And he's screwing it directly into the radiator from the outside of the chassis. So what? Like, unless the AIO typically has holes that go through and then, no, because the fan's just gonna fall off on the underside. Okay, he's probably broken his all-in-one now, unless he's planning to not put any fans in this whatsoever and it's gonna be the best passive AIO I've ever seen, or the first passive AIO I've ever seen. <sighs> right. And they take forever. They take forever because you're using the wrong screws. He's... Ah. So next up, cables. Every power supply is gonna come with a big bag of Velcro cables. Okay, every power supply is gonna come with a big bag of cables. It's not gonna, not every power supply because not every power supply is modular. You have modular power supplies, semi-modular, and then just normal straight cables. So that's a bit of a misleading statement. It's kind of daunting at first. So you always have to find the ones that are gonna fit. In this case, you need to match those cables with the correct descriptions on the power supply. No, no, um, no. This should be done before you install the PSU. Uh, sorry, brick. We're installing the CPU, the heart. 
Why the hell is the CPU not installed at this point? I mean, it should be one of the first things. It's so much easier doing it outside of the case, like I said earlier, with the memory and your M.2 drive installed correctly with the standoffs and then put into the case. It's just easier. Please do not take advice from this video. The, the video I'm watching, not my video. Part of the computer or the brain, depending on how you look at it. So to do this, we're just gonna remove the plastic covering that they put on the motherboard. We're just gonna take this little plastic part out. We'll just toss that out of here. And okay, he just took the CPU socket cover off and then just threw it away and like, we don't need this. Well, it's always handy to have because if you change your CPU at a later date or you upgrade your motherboard, how are you gonna protect the socket? Because you need a CPU socket cover, which you've just thrown away. Secondly, when you do install the CPU, and you've probably seen it in my videos before, when you actually line the CPU up and pull the lever back down, that actually pops off naturally. It's just one of them things. That's how it's designed. Right. And now we have an exposed CPU holder, or rather slot. A CPU holder or slot. It's called a socket. S-O-C-K-E-T. Socket. On the motherboard. And we're gonna use the CPU applicator. This is a special little part that not everyone may get, but this motherboard that we got from A. Okay, two things. He's using a CPU installation tool, which is a bit pointless. Um, I've never used one, never needed to use one. And also he's pushing down on the back of the CPU with a thermal paste spreader. That is a very, very bad idea. It's like trying to get it into the applicator of installation tool by pressing down on like exposed contacts. Don't do this. That we got from ASUS definitely does have. It's called a CPU installation tool. It makes it really useful if you want to install a Core i7 hexacore CPU. Yeah, we've got one and it's an eighth generation chip and it's ready to go. He makes it sound like it's the rarest CPU ever. We got one, I've, I've got one too. You could literally buy them in any retailer, so Amazon, Scan, Overclockers, Newegg, anywhere. They're not that rare. And it's ready to go, and it supports overclocking. So what having this little installer does for you is it's basically a brace. That you <laughs> Again with the brace, stop mentioning brace. It's not a brace. Brace, bracket, slot, lanes. Ah. That you can apply right to the CPU and light it up with the triangle. Why is he installing it into the installation tool again? Like, didn't he just do that using the thermal paste spreader on the back again? Bad idea, but now he's just showing it again. Oh, I don't know. <sighs> so we're about to apply thermal paste to the CPU. Why are we about to apply thermal paste to the CPU? I'm looking in the AIO, like typically AIOs come with like a thermal, uh, a small amount of thermal paste already pre-applied. You do not need thermal paste. It's already there. Sometimes, and even I've done it to sort of, you know, do comparison results because I like certain brands of thermal paste, the way that it applies, the temperatures I get, I will actually clean them off with ice pro alcohol and then put my own paste on, but I'm not gonna put paste on as well. CPU. Every CPU cooler actually comes with a bit of thermal paste already neatly applied in a circle around it, but it's usually not enough. It's good, essentially PC building practice to have a little bit extra. Usually, usually not enough. I'm done. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and layer it on top of the CPU. The final portion. Okay, so there's many different ways to apply thermal paste. I've actually done tests myself, uh, loads of other people on YouTube and across the internet have done loads of tests themselves. So you have the P method, you basically, like a little P, like tiny little ball. Uh, you can do the line method on bigger processors like Threadripper. We typically do like an X or like a Union Jack style kind of, you know, thing. It looks like he's using the constellation method. Apparently this is a new method. It's like dot line, dot line. <laughs> I've never seen this before. I've been doing this pretty much all my life and I've never seen this ever, ever. ...is to add the CPU cooler to the top end of the processor. So you're gonna see that there- Holy shit! It, wow. Um, so his constellation method has now kind of turned into 
I guess the bird shit method. It literally looks like a bird of shit all over the processor. I shit you not. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, I'm gonna be very surprised if this um, if this boots. And he still hasn't moved the memory. The memory's still next to each other. So no dual channel memory this time. That there are four brackets, or rather like screws in here with brackets and holders right here. And they're going to keep the cooler raised off the processor, but it's also gonna be close enough to actually physically come in contact with it. Like basically keep it cool. Take thumb screws like this and just screw them on. Thumb, thumb screws like this and then doesn't show you anything. So like what? I can't see. If, if I was building my first PC and I wanted to watch something, you know, as a guide, I'd want to see how it's done. Do I screw it this way, this way? Where do I screw it? What am I screwing? So now that our internals are done, we're gonna put all the panels back on, which is the top glass, side glass, front glass, and of course the back panel where all of this fun stuff is happening. So we fully built the PC. Every <laughs> so that cable management though, um, I thought the NVMe drive was, you know, supposed to help with cable management. I don't know what he's done here, but there's just cables everywhere. And I mean, the chassis they're using, they're using the Corsair Crystal Series 2, 280X, which is a pretty good chassis when it comes to cable management. And it, yeah, it's just been destroyed. It's a great chassis for cable management if you know what you're doing. See, everything's put together and we got to the post screen. I'm sorry, but I'm shocked. They got to the post screen. I mean, sometimes like with the dual channel memory issue where it's not in dual channel, sometimes a motherboard will kick up a fuss about that. So I'm surprised that it booted then with the bird shit-esque thermal paste mess. I'm surprised that it booted because of that. There's just so many variances with this build that I'm actually surprised they got to the post screen. So well done. <laughs> So right now I'm playing League of Legends. It's one of my favorite games. I'm actually playing against a bot and I'm distracted so I'm not actually doing so well. But um, otherwise, like this is pretty much what you would see me do on a gaming computer. Test stuff out and hopefully- This is what you typically see him doing on a gaming computer. Playing games. Okay, way to go, Captain Obvious. Um, that's basically the end of the video. He just sits there and plays some more games or pretends to play games while he's like looking at the camera. Hey, how you doing? How you doing, yeah? Yeah, you good, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I needed to make this video because I get people ask me all the time on how to build a gaming PC, how to build just a general computer. And I send them links to, you know, our YouTube channel and some of the guides we have on etechnics.com. There's people out there, I mean, I'm looking at the video now and it has 202,370 views. Admittedly, The Verge have a bigger following than we do on YouTube. They've got 2.1 million subscribers. So potentially there's 2.1 million people who may want to build a PC who are just subscribers are going to be watching this video on how not to build a $2,000 gaming PC. I'm just baffled, I really am. And I have also seen that since this video has gone up uh, initially, YouTube comments are now disabled. The like and dislike buttons are still there, but it doesn't actually show you how many likes and dislikes they have. And I've seen people commenting on their newer videos and even their older videos, and then them getting blocked and banned and their comments deleted. On Twitter, there's people within the industry who have made similar videos to this, and even people who haven't, who have called The Verge out and the guy presenting it, and he's blocked them on Twitter. This is just crazy. The best thing The Verge could possibly do right now is delete the video, maybe just let it lie like that, or delete the video and put up another video to sort of say sorry. It's just misleading people, and that's one thing I hate. As someone in the industry who sometimes gets referred to, and I hate the word, an expert in the industry, I mean, I'm still learning every single day, but I know how to build a custom gaming PC. And if I was going to do it, I would do it the right way and make sure that it's factually correct, which is something that The Verge just haven't done. So that's really sort of angered quite a few people within the industry and even outside of the industry. The Verge, take it how you want, but people are not happy. So I thought I'd make this video as a bit of a laugh to do because it kind of goes against the major fundamentals that I know as someone who builds PCs pretty much every single day. And take it kind of as you will. And uh, I still think the best one was the whole brick part. But if you do want to build a custom gaming PC, Here's one I built earlier. 
Now, I think you could probably class this as a bit more of a custom gaming PC. This is probably less than $2,000, and all I've got to do right now is fill it up with fluid, and off it goes. Don't know, maybe take a leaf out of some other people's books. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button. Remember to subscribe and click the little bell icon. And yes, we do have videos on how to build gaming PCs the right way. I'll see you in the next one and let us know if uh, you like this video by commenting below. See you later guys.